continue our, our study in, in the book of Ezra. And uh, last week we were observing the uh, pattern of, uh, of revival, how when God calls you to rededicate yourself and, and you begin to come, uh, then the enemy brings a resistance your way and, uh, and resistance sometimes sets you back for a little bit. But then eventually in, in the fifth chapter, we saw that he uses the prophets, uh, Haggai and, and, and uh, Zechariah, and, and they begin to prophesy. And with the prophesying, then what happens is you get back to the work of serving the Lord. And this time they were back to the work of uh, building the temple. And they're and now they're they're really working hard. They're laboring because the prophets stir up the good gift that's inside of us. When, when uh, we are saved, and in the Old Testament, when one uh, turned in faithfulness to the Lord, uh, David talked about the Holy Spirit of God. It was uh, spelled a little differently. It was a little H O L Y uh, spirit, but that that Holy Spirit that God put in them and. And when we get saved, we get that Holy Spirit placed in us. But what will happen is if we just kind of sit still, it'll settle down deep inside of us and just kind of get still. And it needs to be stirred up. That good gift needs to be stirred up. And God uses the prophesying of his word. And, and here come the prophets. And now they're working. And, and no sooner than they are returning as the servants of the God of heaven, verse 11. And they returned an answer saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And we're building this house. And they're, they're doing the work of the Lord. And, and uh, the, uh, the enemies start up again. And I guess, I guess what the Lord wants us to understand this is a, a reality. It's a, it's a sober truth. And, and Paul told his young ministers, you got to be sober. And he didn't, he wasn't talking about not being drunk with alcohol. He was saying you need to be sober in your spirit and understanding that there is a battle, an ongoing battle that will not end. This war will not end until Revelation 20, when that enemy is thrown into the pit and and they seal him up until that time his job is to work against the work of god and so he just wanted us to see that so what had happened was the enemies decided what we're going to do this time is we're going to try to enlist the government in our help and we're going to send a a letter to the governors to say that these people need to stop building because they claim that they had authority to go forth and to do this work. So um, he, he said, uh, verse 17 of, the, of chapter 5, we ended last week. So therefore, if it seemed good to the king, let there be a search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem and to let the king send his pleasure to us concerning the matter. And they were very confident, the enemies of the Lord were confident that there is no decree for God's work here. Well, uh, surprisingly, the adversaries are going to find out that God has decreed that his work will go on. And God occasionally will use a king to set forth that decree. So here's what happens, chapter 6. And we get to this tonight. And then Darius the king made a decree. And search was made in the house of the rolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Okay, today we're used to computers. Uh, before that, 50 years ago, we were used to file cabinets. But, but going back to this particular time, the only one that really had printed material were the rulers of a land. They had the wealth to use a papyrus and vellum and have things written down on rolls at that time. And they had a, a chamber where they things were stored and there were scribes and uh, chamber men and th that would keep an eye on these things. And, and so he sends over to the house of the rolls, which is like the courthouse at that particular time, where the treasures and the various scrolls are kept. And, and the Babylon was... Uh, the place where the longest time they had their large library. And so that's where they kept these things in verse 2. And there was found at Akmitha in the palace that's in the province of the Medes a roll. And therein was a record thus written. So somebody found this. He said, look what I found under uh, R, uh, filed under R, this roll here. And it was sub uh, standard T for, you know, sub 
T and for temple. And they open this thing up and here's what they read in, in verse three. In the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Here's the decree. Notice it starts with a capital L. The decree would be like, here begins a decree with quotation marks. Let the house be builded. The place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. And so a decree had been made. Uh, the Lord had worked in the heart of a Cyrus. Now, this is around, I don't know, about 520 B.C. But it's interesting. This work is a fulfillment of Scripture. Because about 100, almost 200 years before that, God told Isaiah that this is what he was going to do. So you'd have to go to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 44. Known unto God are his decrees. And God has decrees and a timetable. Known unto God are his days, it says in Job 24. And he has decrees and days and covenants and a timetable. They're called uh, the predetermined times appointed of God when Peter was preaching in Acts. He knows what they are. Those signposts are laid out and he's revealed them to us by his servants, the prophets. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, and here at the particular time, it's about uh, 715 B.C. So Cyrus, we're reading this thing happening about 515 B.C. We're looking almost 200 years before that particular time. And, and here's what the Lord uh, said, um, verse uh, 1 uh, yet now hear Jacob my servant and Israel whom I have chosen thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb which will help thee fear not O Jacob my servant and thou Jesurun that's another word that he has for the Jewish people in Jerusalem whom I have chosen I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. And he's promising that he's going to do this. And, and he said, um, skipping toward the end of the chapter, verse 24, thus saith the Lord, thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. The wisdom of the world knows not God, and so God's chosen to make their wisdom look foolish. Verse uh, 26, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to confirm the word of my servants, is what he's saying, and perform the counsel of, that would be my messengers, that say to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed palaces thereof. Here they're looking, they're about to be destroyed by the Babylonian invaders. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in, he's going to burn the city, he's going to carry away people captive. It's going to look like the end, but it's not the end. I'm going to do this. Verse 27, I say to the deep, be dry, and I dry up the rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to, to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So, so 200 years before Cyrus made the decree, God said, he's going to make the decree. How can you do that? Because I am the Lord. I do all things according to the counsel of my will. And it's my will that there be a holy city with my name and my temple. I will never leave myself without a witness. And if I have to twist the arm of some heathen behind his back and make him say, Uncle, I'll do it to him. He may not like it, but I'll make him do it. I'll make him bend the knee. If he won't do it in humility, I'll put him down there. Don't underestimate the power of your God. 
all these diviners and these kings that they are going to fight against Israel and fight against Jerusalem and fight against God's church. Jesus said, when I build my church, even the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And if the devil and his servants can't, don't you worry about pounds of flesh. And so back here in Ezra, when they do the search, well, there it is. The decree has been made. Verse three, Cyrus made the decree about the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded. Let the place where they offer sacrifices, let the foundation be strongly laid. And the height thereof, make it three score cubits. So that's 60 cubits. So a cubit is about a foot and a half. That's 90 feet high. That's a, 90, a nine story building. It's going to be a big temple. And the breadth thereof, a three score cubits. And uh, going to be 90 feet across. What's this room? About 25 feet across? Maybe 30 at the max? So three times as wide. So the central gathering place where they're going to uh, have the Ark of the Covenant and, and do the worship of the Lord. It's going to be a big room there for the priests to congregate in. And, and let there be, verse 3, three rows of great stones and a row of new timber. And let the expense be given out of the king's house. In other words, Cyrus is going to pay for it out of the treasuries of Persia. <laughs> Who put that expense on our budget? God did. <laughs> and there's no voting against it. We're paying for it. Otherwise, God may take our life and kill our firstborn like he did to Pharaoh. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's coming out of the king's house. Verse 5. Also, let the golden and the silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, let them be restored and brought again to the temple, which is at Jerusalem, every one to his place, and place them in the house of God. And then he continues his writing. Uh, Darius continues this writing about what Cyrus had said. Now, therefore, Tetnei, uh, uh, governor beyond the river, and Shethar Bosnei, and your companions, the Afar Sactites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. Let the work of this house of God alone. You guys get away. Leave those men to do their work quietly and peaceably without any bother from you. No more trouble. This is the king of the, the empire at this time, the prevailing empire. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews, verse 7, and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place and moreover I make a decree what you shall do to the elders of these Jews for building this house of God that of the king's goods even of the tribute beyond the river forthwith expenses be given to these men that they be not hindered by the way when you collect the taxes I want you to take part of the taxes give it right back to the builders there so they can build God's house you, you like this Hey, this day's coming real soon, folks. The, the, the end is, is right near upon us. Uh, clouds of glory, the Lord's going to come back and he's going to turn all the revenues and the profits of the wicked to the just so they can do the work of God. That's what's going to happen. We're going to see all this building in the millennium as God takes all the wealth of the devils collected and all his kingdoms. See, these are my kingdoms if you bow and worship me. And he's thinking, I don't have to bow and worship you now. If I wait, my father's going to give me those kingdoms. And I'm going to take all of this from you and give it to my people. And that's the portrait that's given. How do I know it's going to happen? It's written. It, it is written. The scriptures cannot be broken. And he's giving you a portrait of it right here. And, and he said, you do this that they be not hindered. Right now, we face hindrances when we attempt to do our work. Because God has not yet put it in the heart of a king to take care of his people, but he will. Now, we face hindrances in the meantime. For example, if you were to go to 1 Thessalonians, when Paul was writing one of his first epistles to the Thessalonian church, and um, he wanted to minister to those people, Paul is always looking to do the work of ministry. That's to be a servant. That's to advance God's gospel. That's to build them up in the truth. 
and to strengthen them in their faith. And he was trying to get to these people and uh, he had to write this letter to them from Athens. He was stuck in Athens at the time. Thessalonica is not too far from Athens, but he wasn't able to get there. And he says in chapter 2 of the first epistle, he says, uh, verse 17, We brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, we can't get to you physically, but not in heart, we even endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. We really want to make a trip to you. Verse 18, wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. I mean, one of the, the things that we have to learn as a servant, as a disciple, now not as a baby Christian, because God's not going to put babies into fights. He's going to protect them in the nursery and take care of them. But to those that are beginning to grow in the faith, you got to recognize that so often you want to get something done and there's a hindrance and there's a door closing. You think, oh, oh, the, the Lord's closing the door. No, the Lord has opened the door. Satan is just trying to block it from you. And you have to have the discernment to know when it's, when it's Satan blocking a door. By the way, Satan will open doors for you to go through that you shouldn't. He'll usually do that. He does control the world and he'll make great worldly opportunities available for people. So they'll go through an open door into the world and keep from the work of God. But when it comes to the work of God, he's always trying to hinder it. He's trying to hinder those of us that are servants. The hindrance that I think is above all things to him. Go back to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. He'll hinder financially. He'll hinder physically. He'll hinder traveling opportunities. But one of the greatest things he wants to hinder above all things is hinder the bringing forth of the pure gospel to someone. And so he works that. We were at a Bible study, again, talking to you this morning, that on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock in Tanawanda at Brother Al's church, they, they do a Bible study, just a kitchen table Bible study down in their basement like we do here. They have some coffee and we just open the Bible. We're going through the book of Revelation. And I was there this morning from about 10 to 11, maybe 1130. If you ever want to come join us on a Thursday morning, it's a very informal study. And then afterwards, we'll go downtown and preach. We did today. It was a good good time to be down on the street. But you're welcome to come. Some came to the study and then went home. Some came from the study and then went with us uh, downtown. But we were looking at this uh, today, and I was explaining that the devil, one of the great works that he does in terms of hindering, is hindering someone from seeing the, the true gospel. He'll try and put a false gospel. And the way he needs to do that is he needs to work in changing the writings of God. So notice in uh, Luke chapter 11, the Lord is uh, really rough on these guys. Verse 46, woe unto you, you lawyers, for you bade men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. And then, he, and then he says in verse 52, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And the lawyers, they, were, they, they weren't you know, the lawyers that we get in the yellow pages today. These were the lawyers that handled the law of God. And they were the scribes, and they started writing their own interpretations, and they started writing the uh, Talmud, and, and their commentaries on it. And we really think the passage means this. And, and these words can be better translated this way. And they were changing and altering God's words. And through doing that, they were getting people off course. So they were missing the mark. Of course, they themselves for doing it were being cursed by God. He said, you're not going in. You, you actively change the word of God. That's a no-no in God's sight. So those men, they're not going in because they've been changing God's word. They're cursed with a curse that's going to send them to hell. But then the problem is, as they begin to change it, the people reading it are missing the mark and, and it's hindering people from entering into truth too. We were talking about that today in, in this present world of seven and a half billion people, there are two billion people that claim they're Christians. 
You got one point four billion in Catholic churches. You got uh, five hundred million in mainline Protestant churches, and another fifty to one hundred million in newer created Christian things in the eighteen hundreds, Christian Science and stuff like that. And they think they're Christians, but how many of them have been born again, redeemed, converted, and justified? And if they haven't been, what's hindered them? It's been the teachings of the place where they go. And you can read the writings of these people. They're the lawyers in these particular uh, sects and cults, I don't care how big organizationally they are, have changed it and hindered people from going in. And Satan continues to work hindering to this day. I'm looking forward to the day when God shuts them up and says, uh, let these men alone that they be not hindered anymore. That's going to be the millennium, folks. In the millennium, he's not going to be hindering the work, our work of dealing with all those babies that are going to be born in the millennium and us going out and bringing them gospel truth. There will be no hindrances. What a blessing that's going to be. Getting back to where we are in Ezra chapter 6. Hindrances. Now going back to what happened uh, historically. So, so the decree has been made and the decree has gone out from the king and the ruler himself. And, and he says, don't hinder them. Verse 9, and that which they have need of both young bullocks and rams and lambs, all these things they need for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven. And they need wheat and salt and wine and oil. According to the appointment of the priests, which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. Wow, this is nice. <laughs> imagine, I mean, imagine the government coffers open to the work of God today. Do you have any idea how much money they have in those government coffers? You're talking about budgets that are trillions of dollars. Those are numbers that are astoundingly insane. Uh, just an astounding amount of, num of money. I, I don't think we can fathom it. I'll, I'll try and give you an idea how much it is, but you still won't fathom it if I try and make it as simple as I can. A million dollars is a thousand dollars a day for three years and then it's gone. A billion dollars is a thousand dollars a day for 3,000 years and it's gone. A trillion dollars is $1,000 a day for 3 million years. That's $1 trillion. They spend $4 trillion in a year. Imagine if some of that came the church's way. That'd be nice. Well, that's what's happening here. God twisted his arm and he said, give him the money. <laughs> it's not ours for our worthless programs anymore and funding terrorists all over the world and putting into pensions of people that don't work and just have their feet up in air conditioned buildings and give orders to everyone else. It's not what it's for. Let's give it to God's work. And you see to it that they have a day by day, uh, verse, end of verse nine, without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savers unto the God of heaven and, and pray for the life of the king and of his sons <laughs> because if he gets angry i'm in a heap of trouble he can take my breath away in a split second i want you you anything god wants give it to him in my name <laughs> as a man that had the fear of god by the way the fear of god's the beginning of wisdom fear of god's the beginning of knowledge those are good things to have and 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 he and he says uh, verse 11 and also i've made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word. In other words, I've made a decree. This is the king's decree. This is my word, the king. And when I make it, I don't want any lawyers messing with it. If anybody alters my word as the king of Persia, uh, let timber be pulled down from his house and then be set up and let him hang, be hanged thereon. Take the timber of his house, will make a gallows with the timber of his own house and hang him and let his house be made a dunghill for this. I mean, for, for a short period of time there, you know, here's how the Lord works. The Lord starts a work. He starts it on high ground, like Jerusalem is 2,700 feet above sea level. Like they were in the garden, they were on high ground in relationship with God. And then man eventually begins to tumble down. Their story was a Jack and Jill went down the hill or up the, somebody went tumbling down and they, they start to tumble down. And then the Lord, when he starts again, he starts it right back up on high ground. 
And that's what he's doing here. He said, look, it, look, it's time for revival. I got to bring this back up and wind it up and get it up here high again and get it started in the right place. The Lord is always shooting for higher ground. It's the mountain of God's holiness. That's the way he builds. That's the way he starts. So he says, look, I want everything for these people. Let's get it right up there. And when it's up there, let's understand who's in charge. I am, and this is my word. And if anyone breaks it, Early on in all of God's working, and you take a look at when Moses came down from the mount when he had fresh the word, and God was just beginning that work, and those people disobeyed and made a calf, 3,000 died in a day. When God was just beginning his work of his church, just beginning that brand new precious work and it was on high ground and they were preaching with fire and power in the streets and the Holy Ghost was coming down and somebody lied in God's church. Was it Ananias and Sapphira? God killed him right there. I mean, early on when it's on high ground, God doesn't tolerate any disobedience. And, and that's right here. It says, anybody, anybody messes with this? Uh, tear their house down, take the wood, build a gallows, hang them on it, and make the house a dunghill. We'll put ants there, and we'll put all the garbage and the refuse. Does that, yes? I, well, here's what I think. Go to Daniel, I believe it would be chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Now, Daniel had been taken as a, as a teenager, and uh, he had purposed in his heart that he would always stay true to God's word to the best of his ability. He was humble about it. He would ask the people over him, may I try to do this God's way instead of yours? They would give him a chance, and God's ways always work, and God always advanced him th for his obedience. And for 70 years, Daniel survived through the entire Babylonian kingdom. And at the end of the fifth chapter, that's when the kingdom was taken. Verse 30, And that night Belshazzar, that was the third king of Babylon, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom. He was about 62 at the time he took it. That'd be my age. And then it says, verse 1 of the next chapter, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these... There would be three presidents over the 120, so I guess each guy had 40 guys under him, of whom Daniel was the first. Daniel was, verse 3, preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Daniel had great influence with Darius. It was during this time of the Persia, Persian kings of Darius uh, was Persian king. Uh, Cyrus was the Median. The Persians and the Medes were uh, two kingdoms that were kind of molded together. Um, if I remember correctly, Cyrus was actually Darius's nephew. They were related. And so the two of them related. And Daniel uh, was greatly respected because he had integrity. He was a man of his word. Not many people in government are. And this just isn't American government. This would go on in German government, in English government, in Babylonian government. People that tend to want to get to government and want to get to high places usually want to do it for the wrong reason. They usually have some spiritual wickedness in them. They usually got the devil pushing them because the devil wants to run the kingdoms of the world. So he puts his people in that position. And, and you begin to know, I can't trust that guy. I can't trust that one. And all of a sudden comes a man whose words and his works are good as gold and a handshake or a word from him is as good as a signed contract and you, you, I can trust that guy and and that's how they saw Daniel and Daniel made great influence to those people as a matter of fact um, when the Lord Jesus Christ Daniel told them about the star in the book of numbers he said one day there's going to star going to appear in the west you guys are in the east and that star is going to appear and when that star appears that's the sign of the coming of the king of kings. And he told those Persian wise men, and they told their kids, who told their kids, who told their kids, who told their kids. And 500 years later, there was a few Persian wise men still looking for him. When that star appeared, they went because of Daniel's influence. 
Daniel's influence went on for generations after. And so, yeah, I, I have a feeling that Daniel had great influence. Matter of fact, you read the rest of that chapter, the king was so upset when those men tried to uh, come up with a scheme to hurt Daniel. And, and you can read that chapter on your own. So, yeah, going back to where we are. You know, one of the problems with the heathen, if you will, both in Old Testament times and in New Testament times, is many heathen, from the time they are raised, are raised with error. And they're raised with uh, wrong teaching. And they're raised with uh, corrupt and, and deceiving doctrine. But they don't know that. They're children. They take it. And when truth comes, there are a few heathen somewhere that want truth. Darius was one. Cyrus was one. A few of those wise men in Persia were such. And so are the people maybe at your workplace, a few of them. And maybe a few in your neighborhood. And, and those are the ones where God's going to make a difference. And God's word's going to make the difference. And you having a life of integrity and being faithful to God and his word and his son could have that influence like Daniel had. You can dare to be a Daniel. It's possible. So back to where we were, uh, we, we see what he says in verse 11, uh, that if, if they, he says, I've made my decree and you falter my word, then let the timber be pulled down. You know, that was a time where the government was in line with true, pure, undefiled religion of God. It's only happened a few times in history. It happened under the time of Solomon and David. It happened here at this particular time. It happened in England in the, in the early 1600s when, when King James, who had been raised by a mom who ha had the, the Bible, and uh, and learned these things, and and then when he was young, there was a. I, I guess he might have been an Anglican priest. I don't know, but one that had a Bible, and was showing him the scriptures as a young man, and started to teach him what the Bible said in Latin and what it said in the English version. They had the Tyndale and the Wycliffe version at the time, and to teach him various languages. And he was hearing the scriptures and began to dedicate his life. And when he became the king, he said, "You know, what we need more than anything. We need a Bible for the common man." And he took the resources of the kingdom and gave them for the work of God. And there was a time that happened in America in the late 17 and early 1800s, when, when our Congress, the first book that they spent money on printing was the King James Bible to be put in the public schools. That was a work of Congress that was United States government money to get the Bibles to those schools, and they wanted public schools so that our children could learn to be literate, could learn to read God's Word. The primers were, you know, interesting. Uh, uh, C is for Christ. Yeah, I mean, it was just interesting to read the primers as you went through those things. And they taught these children how to learn about the Lord. There was times like that. There were decrees made that if anybody did anything against God's word, that they were like a dunghill to society. If a man decided to break his marriage vows in the 17 and 1800s and commit adultery, yeah, they had scarlet letters for them. They were made dunghills. It was, this was a time we were trying to let God's law be the law of the land. They were short periods, but thank God for them. What a blessing. Uh, circuit riding preachers went all around this country and preached from town to town and village to village and people got saved. Bars were shut down. Towns were changed. Families were strengthened because that decree went forth. Now, now I'll tell you something. Verse 11. I have made a decree. We're in Ezra 6, 11. That's a, a, a human king. He says, I've made a decree that nobody better alter my writing. What do you think God thinks about people altering his writing and changing his words? There are quote unquote Christian scholars today. They're not Christians. They just tell you they're Christians. They're as Christian as those one and a half billion people we talked about a little while ago that claim they're Christians, maybe on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones. They've never been regenerated. The only ability they have is they can speak Hebrew. 
or they can speak Greek. And so they come along and they alter God's words and they make new Bibles. They make new Greek Bibles. They make new uh, Hebrew Bibles. They make new English Bibles and they alter God's word. You know what God's going to do one day? He's going to take their houses. He's going to pull it up and make a gallows and hang them before everybody and make their name dung for all of eternity. If, if a king of the earth can do this, what do you think the king of kings is going to do with his word? He's told you throughout not to change his word, beginning in Deuteronomy, going through Proverbs, all the way to Revelation chapter 22. Do you want me to show you the verses? You already know them. Verse 12, and he finishes his decree. And the God that caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put their hand to altar and destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. And let God's word have free course and be glorified and God speed to it. That's what God would like. And uh, I, I wish we could get some Darius's and Cyrus's now to make decrees like this. But at least get some pastors that'll make it from a pulpit and try and decree, let's get God's word out there. Well, anyways, uh, the adversaries were surprised when this letter arrived. Verse 13, then Tatnai, the governor on this side of the river, and Shethar Bosnai and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so did they speedily. Why? You know that what these guys live by? The fear of man. And they don't want to stand up to a king. At that time, the king could have your head taken off just like that. He, he didn't need to have a court and 12 people in a jury box and some defense attorney. You did something against the king when he made a decree. It was off with your head. And so they, they obeyed right away. Uh, verse 14, and the elders of the Jews, they builded. And they prospered again through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. You know, the greatest thing that's needed is prophesying. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 14 is a, 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 a whole chapter about spiritual gifts. And he says... He that prophesieth speaketh unto men. For what purpose? To edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Unknown tongues isn't going to build up the church. Prophesying is. Verse 5, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. You know what the need of the church is today? Some men that can prophesy. What is that? Well, basically prophecy Prophecy with a C is a noun. And prophecy is the words of God, the written words of God. Now, God used speaking prophets, but now they're written. So now prophecy is found in the written words of God. Prophesy is a verb. Now I actively take those words and I speak the words of God. And to prophesy is to speak God's word. And when you speak God's word, you comfort people's hearts. You edify, you build up their mind. And you exhort their will. You touch the three important inner parts of them. The mind, the heart, and the will. That's the trinity of sanctuary inside their temple. And to prophesy is what's required to do that. You know, the, the easiest thing for a minister of God's word to, to do is just minister God's word. When, when I'm up here and I'm reading God's words to you, that's when I'm doing my best good. When you're ministering to a lost soul, it's nice to try and explain it in your own words, but it's so wonderful when you can read or show them verses of scripture and take the written words of God and speak them to their ears 
and show them to their eyes. That's the work of prophesying. And that's what's needed. And you know what that does? It causes you to build. It causes you to prosper spiritually. And that's what happened. Verse 14, the elders of the Jews built it and prophesied and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. And they built it and they finished it according to the commandment of God. The only way we'll finish the work of God is with the word of God. If we abandon the word of God, we're going to have unbuilt churches. They're not going to be completed. Imagine a building that doesn't have a roof or doesn't have walls or doesn't have a place to sit down. No one wants a building like that. That's what God's church looks like today. It's got big gaping holes in it, empty spots where the walls haven't been built and, and it hasn't been furnished spiritually with the right things because today many pastors aren't prophesying the words of the prophets anymore. They're reading, I don't know what they're reading, contemporary things, magazine articles, newspaper articles, trying to keep up with the times and current events. Current events are going to change. They're not going to be current next week. But this book is forever. That's what's needed. And so they build it and they finished according to the commandment of God and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Verse 15, and the house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. Adar was the 12th month in the uh, Jewish calendar. So, so they finished their course at the, at the end of the year. That's perfect. God kept them busy all year long. Verse 16, and the children of Israel, the priests and, and the Levites and the rest of the children of the captivity, they kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. That's the way they dedicated Solomon's temple. You can read about it in Second Chronicles chapter 7. You read about all the joy that they had when that temple, you know, the, the work of God in building his house and seeing his house completed should bring joy. Imagine if, if God was able to work through us and get our family members saved and get our closest friends and neighbors and coworkers saved and build his house with those people. Wouldn't that bring joy to a lot of us? Well, well, in order for that to get done, we need to be speaking the words of God. That's the only hope we have. The word of God is quick and powerful. That's what's needed. And so they offered it with joy. Verse 17, they offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks and 200 rams and 400 lambs for the sin offering for all Israel and 12 he goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses. If we went back to First Chronicles 24, you'd find that uh, each grouping of Levites had a specific job to do. And when God distributes his gifts, they're distributed differently, just like on a football team, different uh, people with different roles and different positions, yet all working together gets the job accomplished. Uh, uh, you have to have the right division, rightly dividing the word and right div rightly dividing the workers the way God said it, uh, verse 18, set in their divisions and in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses, and the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. They finished the building on the 12th month. The next month came around and they were right back to having that great feast of the Passover for the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and they killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren, the priests and for themselves and the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity and all such has had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat and they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy for the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God the God of Israel and so we see here the finish work of God and it is done through the work of the prophet, stirring up the good gift that's in people, people then giving free will offerings to themselves and working together. No strife, no backbiting, no fighting, all marching, following the Savior in, in his way, in his course toward his goal, and God finishes that work. Now, 
Notice the children of Israel, verse 19, uh, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month. Now, this was a very important day to the Jewish people. Uh, back in, in Exodus chapter 12, when the Lord uh, sent that death angel throughout the land, and that death angel told them, you, you better pick the lamb, and, and you do with the lamb exactly the way I say to do it, and take that blood and apply it to the door, and the angel will pass over your house. The death angel will pass over your house. And in chapter 12, he, he explained to them that... Uh, this blood shall be a token upon the houses where you are, he says in verse 13. And, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And the reality is, as we were discussing today, when we were heading downtown in the car, going back to the beginning, and, and when sin entered in through both Eve being deceived and then Adam willfully in the transgression. And when sin entered in, along with sin came death. And death passed upon all men. And and God, as the judge, we were saying today, you know, in his righteousness, he would be right. He said, in the day thou sinnest, thou shalt die. He would be right to kill sinners the first day they sin. but But he doesn't. He gives a stretch of mercy to them to allow them to find the Passover lamb so that they can apply by faith the blood of that Passover lamb to the doorway of their heart. So one day when death does knock at their door, that death angel will not destroy them when he smites the land of Egypt. And he finally does smite the land of Egypt, this world in general. Now he told them in verse 14 about this Passover, uh, Exodus twelve fourteen. this day, shall be unto you for a memorial. We just celebrated Memorial Day. And, and Memorial Day, we were commemorating uh, those men that shed their blood so we could have uh, civil freedom. We could have political freedom. Financial freedom, if you will. But, but the greatest freedom is the freedom from the burden and the bondage and the penalty of sin. And that too required blood. It requires the blood of the Lamb. And God said, I want this to be your memorial. This is the most important memorial to you. Uh, he said in verse 14, Ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And here they are, they just rebuilt that temple. And the first thing they celebrated and kept was the Passover. So, so here you can see the obedience to that which is written in the law. I remember one of those guys uh, said uh, at one point to Abraham, oh, oh, Abraham, if you would just uh, send someone back from the dead to speak to my brothers, uh, then, then they'll obey and they'll listen and they'll believe. And he said, if, if they won't believe what's written in the law of Moses, they won't even believe if someone rises from the dead. If you can't believe what God's written down in his book, you're not even going to believe a powerful sign or a wonder or a miracle it won't produce any faith in you and you gotta you gotta believe what god said and you gotta obey what god said and here are these people doing that now interestingly interestingly um ezekiel chapter 45 in the very near future we know that the lord jesus christ is going to return and when he returns, it was promised that he would rebuild the temple in honor of his father. And Jesus will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And there will be a place of worship for the God of gods and the King of kings in Jerusalem during the millennium. And when he rebuilds it, he, he says in, in Ezekiel 45, uh, Ezekiel is giving a vision of what Christ is going to do in the future. Chapters 40 through 48 of Ezekiel are pictures of the millennium when Jesus is ruling and setting up his kingdom. And in the 45th chapter, he tells them, uh, verse 1, Moreover, when ye divide by lot the land for inheritance, 
and God's going to give uh, the land to the nation of Israel and there won't be any Palestinians and there won't be any Hamas and there won't be any Arabs and the devil will be shut up and they're going to be able to build and prosper and serve in peace. And when he gives them that land, he tells them, you know, how to divide that land out. And he says in verse six, and appoint um, the possession of the city, 5,000 broad and five and 20,000 long and over against the oblation of the holy portion, it shall be for the house of Israel. And in the center of Israel, he says, you're going to have a place that's 5,000 cubits long. So I don't know what that would be. 7,500 feet. What's that's a mile and a half. And then 25,000, that's about four miles this way. You're going to have a, like the size of Manhattan right in the center of Israel. And this place is going to be dedicated holy ground for God's temple like a piece of land the size of Manhattan, right in the center of Israel. He says, that's what you're going to have. This is the holy portion for the land. He's giving you the dimensions here. And then he says, uh, verse of 16, and all the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. It shall be the prince's part to to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts and in the new moons and in the Sabbaths, all the solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare sin offerings and meat offerings and burnt offerings and peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Verse 21, in the first month and the 14th day of the month, ye shall have the Passover. And for a thousand years, God's going to make him redo the Passover. Now, why? Because what they didn't understand is that when they were doing it the first time, they were putting their faith in the lamb and not seeing that the lamb was just a picture and a type of the one that one day would come walking down the Jordan River and John the Baptist would say, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ is the Passover lamb for us. And they didn't get it. So he's going to give them a second chance in the millennium. And that's what's going to happen. And for 1,000 years, just like today, we, we have the Lord's table and we, we break the bread and we drink the cup and we look back at the Lord's sacrifice. Well, they're going to go redo the Passover now retrospectively rather than prospectively and look back and see it. And he's going to give them a chance. He's going to make over. It's a mulligan. It's a do-over for them. And it's going to be set up right there. That Passover is so important. Now, I was looking at this and, and, and noticing, is there any practical lesson for you and for me? Well, the practical lesson I see is this. Number one, for us to, to really begin to, verse 14, become an elder and to grow up in our faith, we need to build and we need to prosper. And the only way we're going to do this is through the prophesying. We, we need the prophesying. We, we need to hear the word of God. Even, even today at an informal Bible study in a basement, as we we're all sitting there with our Bibles open and just commenting back and forth. And one would read this verse and one would read that verse. And the word of God began stirring everyone up. And, and there was such a, a great uh, energy as we went downtown, just a small group of four or five of us and faced hundreds of lost people and sang to them and preached to them and tracked them. I mean, all that went on because we had been stirred up by the word of God that morning. The prophesying is so important for us to grow in our faith and actually begin that walk. And, and one of the things that's important, he says here, verse 16, the children of Israel, let's say the children of God by Jesus Christ, and the rest of the children of captivity, we're going to keep the dedication of this house of God, or let's say this is the church of God with joy. When, when we hear the right words and we begin to dedicate ourselves, it will be joyous, not grievous. The service of the Lord is, should not be grievous. It should be joyous when you've dedicated yourself to that service. Uh, verse 17, we're going to offer at the dedication, and here we are making that dedication again. There's, there's going to be offerings and there's going to be joy. And what was the key offering? Verse 19, it's the Passover. Our Passover lamb is Jesus Christ. 
the, the preaching of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. That's what God hath chosen, the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. Not only to get you saved, but now to continue to save your ministry through further deepening faith through this. And, and one of the things that was so important for those that, verse 19, that kept that Passover... <laughs> Here's what they did, uh, verse 21. The children which came out of the captivity. Boy, you've been captive to sin. You, you've been captive to a habit that doesn't let you go. You've been captive to a particular situation you can't seem to break out of. Well, when God breaks you out of that, here's what it is. You separate yourselves from the filthiness of the heathen of the land. One of the keys to keeping the dedication with joy after hearing is separation from the filthiness of the land. Sad to say, although America may be clean, I guess they got uh, uh, Clorox sprays and handy wipes and all these things to keep everybody sterile and clean physically. It's a very filthy, dirty land, uh, spiritually, uh, mentally, uh, morally. It's a dirty land. I mean, there's just filth everywhere in America. I mean, the, the concept that anybody can sleep with anybody anywhere, anytime, in any place and be approved of. That, that uh, it doesn't matter if it's man or woman or man and man. It's just we're supposed to tolerate it. Not only tolerate it, we're supposed to celebrate it and have parades for it. I mean, the filthiness that's in America. You've got to separate yourself from it. Uh, uh, watch Paul, Second Corinthians chapter 6. In order to be one of those elders that can build properly, after hearing the, the prophesying, there's got to be some separation from it. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand we live in the world, but we don't condone the things of the world, and we don't want to spend any excess time in the world. If I got to go to a place and paint or do some work, I go to my, I can go do that kind of stuff, but I don't want any of it to rub off on me. I don't want to get involved in the filthy jokes that are going on there. I don't want to participate in them. I don't want to condone them. I don't want anything to do with them. I want to get away and separate myself from them. Second Corinthians chapter six, uh, verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness? That's a believer. With unrighteousness, that's an unbeliever. What communion hath light? Christ is our light. With darkness, the prince of darkness of this world's a devil. He's the one floating all of his dirty, dark ideas out there, using the media and using Hollywood and using the schools and using the coarse language on the streets. We've got no communion with it. Verse 15, what concord, that look, a similar heart, togetherness of heart, hath Christ with Belial, the devil? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? I mean, do you believe God? Do you believe Jesus is is the Savior? Do you believe that God is the creator? Infidels don't believe that. They don't know where things came from. They believe big bangs. They believe evolution. They believe the spirit that floats around. Some people believe there is no spirit. Some people believe in reincarnation. This is infidelity, unfaithfulness to what God's written in his word. What, what part do we have together? Verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? We live in a nation of idolatry. Statues and awards and pictures and banquets and for people who most of these actors and singers are, are drug-using, adultering prostitutes. I mean, and, and we're having awards for them and celebrating and them watching and watching them walk down and people celebrating and making a big deal because someone made a movie, which is make-believe. What are we nuts? How about reality? We've got no part with that. It doesn't make any sense. You're the temple of the living God. You're carrying truth inside of you. Not make-believe, not error, not hypocrisy, not acting, not goofing off. As God said, Verse 16, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, 
Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. Ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Next verse. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. One of the things that Hopefully we do is one of the first things we do is we clean up the flesh. And we stop touching people we shouldn't be touching and, and looking at things we shouldn't be looking at. But also our spirit can get filthy. We can read and believe the wrong things. We have to be so careful with trying to uh, impress that upon. You got two pastors in the morning Bible study with, with you know, members of churches and trying to impress upon them the need for being in God's word because that's something that isn't tainted by the spirit of man and I know good Christian men mean well when they write books and God bless them but there's nothing as holy as this and that's God's word and and I, I told them you know one of the problems is when our spirit gets a little out of line or a little out of whack we were talking about it this morning I mean Inside your body, before you got saved, there was a soul and a spirit, and they used to argue back and forth, and you'd have conversations with yourself, and they would argue as to who was going to drive the body that day, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes, you got three people in there. And what you want to do is the other two get in the back seat and let the Holy Spirit drive. But the Holy Spirit's a real gentleman. If one says, excuse me, can I take the wheel? The Holy Spirit gets in the back seat, and if that spirit, now the soul is now cleansed. That's it, cleansed forever. But that spirit can still get the wrong thoughts. And God says, you've got to come out from all that stuff to, to get that cleanliness in your spirit too. And so going back to where we are, what we see is the, the joy of dedication. Let me show you what Paul said in, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles when he gave his last uh, sermon to the church at Ephesus, Acts chapter 20. The joy of dedication. The elders builded. And, and they prospered. And they served. Dedicated with joy. And Paul told the elders in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20. It's a great sermon. You read it on your own. Uh, verses 17 through 35. It's just one of the greatest sermons in the Bible. And, and, and he said. You know in terms of me. Verse 19, I serve the Lord with humility of mind. And, and verse 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I showed you, I taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, saving that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. As I press on, I know I'm going to face opposition. Here's the key, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Paul said, I've dedicated to building the work of God, and the dedication should be with joy with joy the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God and what we saw here is a period in the book of Ezra where God had revived and stirred them up and he used his word and even told the the king leave the, leave my boys alone so they can serve and what God would like to call us to do is sit under the prophesying of the prophets and dedicate ourselves under the building of God's work and, and joy will follow. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And when the Spirit's allowed to do what He wants to do and He's not grieved and He's not quenched, He'll bring forth real joy. And, and the joy of dedication is seen in this chapter. Any questions? Amen.